Hello everyone and welcome to Amanpour & Company. Here's what's coming up. We have done an amazing job and it's rounding the corner. What's he doing? Nothing. He's still not wearing masks. After head-to-head -head town halls, who will voters trust to take care of America's health amid this pandemic? Andy Slavitt ran Medicare and Medicaid for President Obama, and he'll join me then. Peace cannot be imposed. The desire for peace needs to come from within. Turning swords into plowshares, war reporters as peacemakers. Gary Knight and Robin Wright join me with an ambitious new project. Plus... I will tell you, I fear that we may see worse before we see better. The National Guard story you might not know. Major General John C. Harris tells our Hari Srinivasan how his forces are helping people keep food on the table. Almond Poor and Company is made possible by the Anderson Family Fund, Sue and Edgar Wackenheim III, the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Candace King Weir, the Strauss Family Foundation, Bernard and Denise Schwartz, Charles Rosenblum, Jeffrey Katz, and Beth Rogers. Additional support provided by these funders and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the program, everyone. I'm Christiana Manpour in London. We begin with a tale of two town halls. President Donald Trump and the Democratic candidate, Vice President Joe Biden, both vying for voters on network television. And NBC giving Trump the primetime head-to-head slot, even though he had refused to take part in the joint one organized by the debate commission. The elephant in both rooms was coronavirus, with masks featuring prominently. When a president doesn't wear a mask or makes fun of folks like me when I was wearing a mask for a long time, then, you know, people say, well, it mustn't be that important. After contracting COVID-19 yourself, has your opinion changed on the importance of mask wearing? No, because I was okay with the masks. I was good with it, but I've heard many different stories on masks. If you listen to the head of the, of the CDC, he stood up and he said, you know, while we're waiting for a vaccine, he held up a mask. You wear this mask, you'll save more lives between now and the end of the year than if we had a vaccine. Now, on the numbers and maybe on the issues too, early figures show that Joe Biden won the night handily with over 2 million more viewers than the incumbent. Meantime, the former New Jersey governor, Chris Christie, just out of hospital after COVID care, says he was sorry that he hadn't worn his mask to the now infamous Rose Garden event and during that first debate prep with the president. Right now, new cases of the virus here in Europe exceed those in the United States, but in the U.S., the death toll is climbing and the crisis is a major stress test for the healthcare system and for access to it. Our first guest tonight says this year's election will yet again be a referendum on health reform. Andy Slavitt ran Medicare and Medicaid services under President Barack Obama, and he's joining me now from Minnesota. Welcome to the program, Andy Slavitt. And I just wonder what your takeaway was from the dueling, I mean, I don't even know how to describe it, but the head-to-head -head, um, television reality show last night in which we see the early numbers giving it to Biden. Do you think that's because of the issues? Would you think it's because healthcare is so important? Well, you know, given that, that uh, President Trump is is a such a TV spectacle, it, it's a bit of a surprise. And I think it may, in fact, uh, say that these issues are important to people. I, I think what's very interesting, Christiana, is that if you look around the world, say at Africa, with a population of about 1.3 billion people, um, their death toll has been about 35,000. And compare that to the U.S., which is much, which is about a quarter of the size that has many, many more deaths. What you take away from that is that this is not a particularly high-tech, complex solution. This is a, a very, the mask is a very achievable solution to nations and continents that have been through many public health crises. So the fact that President Trump can't bring himself to even say, uh, you know what, wear a mask, uh, in, in a very simple form, is is really troubling because uh, this only works well if there's unified messaging. And he just continued to equivocate last night, uh, even after what he'd been through. 
So you've raised a really important issue with this comparison of population versus uh, cases, infections, and deaths. And I want to come to that in a moment. But first, I want to ask you what you have written about. And that is that this election, like 2018, you have said yourself, will be yet another referendum on access to health, the idea of healthcare. And I guess you would agree that this issue is now so much more front and center for Americans than it was even in 2018. So do you believe that this case that's going to come up before the Supreme Court a few days after the election, challenging Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, is, is, is really something that's got the, that got the country on a knife edge? So I think there's, there's two very related issues. The first I might liken to the 2008 election uh, with, with uh, Obama versus McCain, where the country was really looking to hire somebody to get us out of the global financial crisis, somebody that would demonstrate experience and competence. And I think as we look at the global pandemic, Americans look at two people, each of whom has had a chance to lead through a global pandemic, obviously Trump with COVID-19 and Joe Biden uh, with Ebola. And so I think in large part, they're making a decision based on who can get us out of this the quickest and the best. And I think very related to that, uh, people know that uh, with millions of people getting COVID, they become pre-existing conditions. And the idea of the uncertainty that this would create and the, and the near certainty of, of millions of people losing insurance, if a Supreme Court case went the other way, means that the only way to insure against that, the uncertainty in the Supreme Court case, is, to a, is for a democratic sweep. Without a democratic Senate and Joe Biden as senator, there's no guarantee that whatever the court does uh, can be turned around by the Congress. So both of those things are very much on the ballot. And I think depending on who you are and where you sit, they affect you differently. If you're a senior, I think you're very much looking at the prescription drug component of the ACA. If you're uninsured, you're looking at another component. Uh, so each of these dimensions, but they all point to health care. Some legal scholars say that this particular case that's coming up is in any event kind of a weak case and that it, you know, it probably won't be won. Um, you know, th those elements of the Obamacare won't be uh, struck down. And of course, even though they're hearing it now, the decision won't come up until the spring. Again, what, what do you think? Do you think the case is strong enough? And OK, now is one thing, but with an extra conservative judge, if that if Amy Barrett is confirmed, what, what do you think is the likelihood for that for that part of ACA to, to remain on the books and for the people? You know, it's a really interesting question as to what motivates justices. Um, if they're motivated by uh, by the law, uh, then I think it's pretty uh, the ACA stands a very good chance. And if you think about what's at issue here this notion of severability. I can't imagine many of these young justices wanting to um, say that every any single word in any law would strike down the entirety of a law. So I, you know, by right, this should be an eight to one or nine to zero case. Um, but you know, these are political appointees, and uh, there there there's a lot less certainty. And uh, you know, I think it's entirely possible that we could see justices making decisions that are not. Uh, comporting with what I think the law would suggest, but instead uh, what their, the political party that appointed them would say. And so take me through what it would look like then, health care in a Biden's America or a Trump's America, um, in terms of the plans each one has laid out. And of course, we know that President Trump has been saying, you know, repeal and replace and whatever, but there hasn't been a plan. So what can Americans look forward to for health care? in either such um, presidency? Well, so uh, I think you know, one, one view of the world is that we each get a helicopter, Marine One, to take us uh, to a wonderful hospital with 15 doctors who give us medication that's not yet approved. Um, uh, that's, that's the healthcare, that's the, that's the closest thing I understand to how Trump thinks healthcare works um, in this country. Um, and you know, unless he's promising that reality, uh, to the rest of the country, I think we're not, uh, you know, I think we're, uh, we should we should be very suspicious. Uh, I think Biden is saying, look, we've made progress. We haven't made enough progress. Uh, everybody in this country should be able to go to bed at night like people in the rest of the world and not have to worry that if someone in their family gets sick, they'll be able to afford to take care of them. 
if Biden is 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 to win, I think he will feel uh, a mandate to push that forward. But what I what I suspect about Biden is that he will want to do it in a way, if he can, that brings along uh, bipartisan support. Because I think that is his, always his first choice. I think that's kind of his character. I think he would uh, pass more stable legislation that way. Um, and of course, if he has to address what the Supreme Court has done, I think uh, they'll, they'll do that quite, uh, quite rapidly. Uh, I don't think Trump will be inclined, all kidding aside, I don't think he'll be inclined to spend much time on health care uh, in a second term, it's not a winning issue for him. It's caused him nothing uh, but grief. And I think if the ACA were to be overturned, I think it would we would probably stand uh, very much in the shambles. Well, let me just read the figures on that. During President Trump's first three years in office, of course, this was pre-COVID, 2.3 million people became uninsured. That's according to the U.S. Census data analysis. 12 million more Americans may have lost health insurance since February, according to a um, study by the Economic Policy Institute. And a poll done in October by CNN found that 61% of Americans say they don't want the Supreme Court to overturn the ACA, Obamacare. We've talked just a little bit about the Supreme Court, but I just want to ask you one more time before going into this idea that President Trump has brought up of herd immunity. Are they ever sensitive to what is going on in the country? It's, a, it's, a, it's an important question, and I believe that they are. Uh, I, I think there's evidence that uh, certainly Chief Justice Roberts uh, does not want to uh, completely overturn uh, things. And if you were going to be sensitive to the country, now would certainly be the time. You know, we have um, millions and millions of people, we don't know how many, that have contracted COVID. And Christian, COVID is the, the ultimate pre-existing condition. If what's at stake here is that people with pre-existing conditions would not, uh, would be able to get discriminated against by insurance companies, you imagine all of the places in the body that COVID impacts, the lungs, the heart, the kidney, the brain, um, the limbs, um, the blood circulatory system, immune system. So imagine a college student who gets COVID now and apparently nothing's wrong, but 15 years from now they get a heart arrhythmia or they have asthma. Um, the insurance company will be able to deny that they have access to insurance simply because they had COVID a decade ago. So this is something that if anybody's paying attention to would realize uh, it's gonna throw things into quite a tricky situation. I might also add, if I have a second, that, um, you know, when, when before the days of the ACA, people were very reluctant to disclose their illnesses because it would preclude them from getting coverage. Mm -hmm. Imagine going through a public health crisis where you can't test, you can't contact trace because people are too concerned about their illness being discovered. I have to say, you know, for, for, for somebody like myself sitting over here in the UK and across Europe where healthcare is a basic right and that we get, you know, we get health care from the national health system or whatever it might be. It really does seem just to be such a cruel situation. So I can understand why it's such an important issue um, when it comes to elections. But I want to ask you on the health, precise health issue of herd immunity. You've seen it was tried in Sweden with uh, actually negative results. They didn't achieve herd immunity despite not locking down. President Trump has again talked about it. He did in the previous, uh, in a previous town hall last month. I just want to play this. It would go away without the vaccine, George, but it's going to go away a lot faster. It would with go it. away without the vaccine? Sure, over a period of time. Sure, with time. It goes and many away. deaths. And you'll develop, you'll develop herd, like a herd mentality. It's going to be, it's going to be herd developed and that's going to happen. That will all happen. Well, you know, and again now, this, this week, the White House embraced what's being called the Great Barrington Declaration, which is a petition, as you know, signed by thousands and thousands of scientists around the world. And they're urging authorities to let coronavirus spread amongst population, the young, the healthy, and try to protect the more vulnerable, precisely to achieve um, not only herd immunity, but to balance health and the economy, in other words, lives and livelihood. What do you think about that? And where has it been tried anywhere in any form or fashion that might give anybody, you know, optimism that it might work. Well, I think the people who say that um, don't understand herd and they don't understand immunity. And I'm not sure they quite understand the economy either. Um, to start with immunity, um, we don't yet know how long immunity lasts, how effective it is. 
And so, you know, by the time you get through a year from now, it may be that all of the people in New York, where we estimate maybe as many as 20 to 25 percent of people have had COVID, uh, their immunity may not be there any longer. So this is at, this is at at best a wild gamble that they understand immunity, and we and we are starting to learn that immunity, in fact, doesn't prevent uh, other strains in other cases. There's a, a, some very well known cases there. The other is the impact on the herd. The the idea that you can isolate people who are vulnerable. When here in the U.S., we've got about 40 percent of Americans that are identified as vulnerable in one form or another, either because of age or health status. It would be nice and convenient to think that they all lived in one congregate setting somewhere where you could just lock the door. But most of those people live in the community. There's only a couple million people that live in, in senior settings. Most people live in multi-generational households with people who go to work every day. And even if you lived in a, in a congregate setting, the people who, who take care of you live in the community. So there's yet to be any evidence that you can, quote unquote, protect people. What this is, in fact, I think is what you described which is, it is a justification to say, I don't want my life, and, and whether you think that's the economy or th anything else, to be inconvenienced uh, on behalf of other people. And that's not a, a, an ununderstandable sentiment. I mean, this is a lot of inconvenience for people. Unfortunately, though, the economy doesn't just bounce back when people are dying every day and people are getting sick every day. For people For people to do the things that will drive the economy back, buy cars, sign leases, take trips, hire people, uh, they have to have, they have to feel safe. They can't do that when there's tens of thousands of people getting sick every day. And as we've seen, and as we discussed on our program last night, the recovery such as it is, has been so-called K-shaped. We've seen the much more, you know, able and wealthy doing very well out of this and the, and the, and the poor basically, and the middle and working class doing very, very badly. So I think that's important to, to keep reminding people. But I want to ask you also about something that you have, I think you have suggested, the idea of trying for elimination, to eliminate this virus. It's a technical term, and I think you've written about it, and clearly it would require very, very aggressive moves and, and, and methods. Do you think it's workable in some way like the United States, and, uh, and, and how aggressive would it, would it be? So if 80 to 90 percent of the country wore a mask for a period of, say, two months, um, the virus would slowly die and then very, very quickly die. So I don't think that the – and it would, would not be eradicated. It would be down to very low levels. And you would be down to, to what I describe as fighting a rabid dog versus packs and packs of dogs, which are, which are much more difficult to fight. To fight. The challenge isn't knowing what to do. The challenge isn't whether or not that would work, I don't believe. The challenge is really more of a sociological one. Americans, like people all over the world, I assume, are fatigued. Um, there is this great debate, this debate that people are having about their individual liberties uh, and and what, what whether or not there is a responsibility to the community that comes along with or supersedes that, that responsibility. That is a cultural issue in the United States. And the president has made um, wearing a mask not only a question of freedom, but he's made it a bit of a sign of rebellion. Um, every time he rips a mask off or or makes a subtle reference to not being sure that whether mask works, it sends a signal and has been sending a signal to his base. I talked to a Republican governor um, just a couple days ago who said in who in the northern part of the U.S. and said that in rural communities he's got almost no mask wearing despite a mask mandate, and in his urban settings, um, where COVID is very much under control because people are wearing masks. So this cultural issue and this cultural divide is really, I think, the substantive difficult issue now in the U.S., not, not even the virus, much more so than the virus. Can I, can I say, I have to say, sitting here, I, I'm just like gobsmacked and shocked to hear you say that. Is something that relatively simple and low tech could achieve the figures that you're talking about. And so I want to ask you then why you think somewhere, as you mentioned, Africa, the continent of Africa with more than a billion people, have got such a low death rate. And as we know, countries that are not as densely populated, like New Zealand, has almost practically uh, eliminated. This is, again, it's a specific word uh, and a specific term, but they've, they've pretty much got rid of it. They're able to control, as you say, one rabid dog and they don't have packs of them. So what is it about these other countries that are doing well? I bet if you and I, Christian, were to sit into sit in a room 
And we had two pieces of paper, one for countries that emphasized individualism, entrepreneurship, um, great wealth, um, and another one for ones that had an emphasis of society, community, equality, um, doing good for the communal spirit. And you put Japan at the top of one list and you put maybe Russia or the US at the top of the other list. I, I bet you we would find that the countries that have that, that are on that second list are doing far, far better. Uh, because there's something about this virus which requires you to sacrifice, even if you don't personally feel at risk. And, and if it's and if wearing a mask is a sacrifice, um, it's come a long way from my grandmother's age when you know ten years, you know, two years without drinking coffee was a sacrifice. But be that as it may, that's where where we are. And I, I do think there is something to the societal construct that 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 hurts us here in the U.S. Uh, as opposed to places in. Uh, in, in the world that, that that do a better job looking out for, for one another. I also think there's something to do with experience. Uh, I mean, we're we're uh, this is a novel thing. In the U.S., I refer to this as our starter virus because, in some respects, um, when you've been through this a few times, um, you know what to do. Hong Kong, of course, mm -hmm. has the greatest amount of travel with mainland China, has um, most people across the border. They they didn't have their first death, I believe, until late in May because people instantly knew how to respond and knew how to react. And in the U.S., I think this is still very new. Um, we still think of this as a new normal, like we did after 9-11, when in fact, um, this is a sort of a privileged uh, nation that has had its defenses rarely get pierced. And when they do, uh, we tend to think that we're in some very strange place. We're not. Um, and we will learn that this is something the rest of the world deals with. But we are going through it for the first time, and I think that accounts for some of this. Whereas in Africa, you know, there's public health crises um, ar ar uh, around the calendar year uh, in Africa, many of them. Mm -hmm. It is extraordinary. Honestly, uh, it, it would be great for that message to really sink into people if, it, if what you're saying is that it could be controlled with just a little personal effort, and which is why we focus on the mask issue, to be frank. It's not just a, a titillating issue for us to play the opposing views of both candidates, but it's because of the kind of thing that you're saying. Um, Andy Slavitt, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Now, it is a truism that starting conflict is, of course, much easier than ending it, and that the opposite of war is not necessarily peace. That is the driver behind Imagine Reflections on Peace, which is an extensive new project by the Seven Foundation, hoping to encourage dialogue around this subject in an important and fascinating book of essays, an exhibition, and two short films. World-renowned journalists, jurists, and diplomats look at how peace rises from the ashes around the world. So joining me now to discuss this is the project's editorial director, photographer Gary Knight, with journalist and contributor Robin Wright. Thank you both for joining me, both um, my good friends from On the Road, and it's wonderful to see you guys back in, in, in this form doing this amazing job. Gary, I want to ask you, what made you come up with this? What, after years and years, and we've been doing it together, covering wars, um, made you make this link towards peace? Well, Christiane, I, I came back from uh, the invasion of Iraq in 2003. I was looking through my pictures and, and started to imagine um, how on earth could peace be made in this country, you know, with a, an occupying force, the beginning of a, of a civil war growing. And from there, I, I thought, well, it'd be really interesting to, to go back to many of the countries that we've all covered uh, during wartime and look at what peace really meant, what, what, it, what the results of uh, peace processes were for the people who had to live with it. And from there, of course, the project, uh, the project grew. You know, I want to just read the dedication. It says, this book is dedicated to those who are living in war while imagining peace and those who are brave enough to build it. So let me just turn, uh, turn to you, Robin, because you are there in, in Beirut, which has obviously been through so many decades of war. And we've just seen this terrible explosion. Obviously, it's not war, but it's just rocked the whole sort of situation there again. And, and you covered the war there. Tell me about the key ingredients in this notion that while at war, so many people actually did imagine peace. 
Well, going back 30 years after the end of the war, it was fascinating to look at what people had emerged from the conflict and tried imaginatively to engage society, whether it was in a new form of politics, a new form of bringing the 18 different religious sects in Lebanon together, uh, in talking about the costs of war. Uh, the tragedy in all of the war zones I think we've covered is that there are not enough people who are engaging in that imagination, that uh, it takes much more bravery to engage in uh, the process of enduring peace than it does to pick up an arm and shoot somebody. And you have to give credit to whether it's former fighters, uh, a young techie that I met. I met a former hijacker. He was the world's record on hijacking, six, uh, who, um, who talk about what the conflict meant to them and how they resent what they went through and wanted to live differently. And we've just been seeing some beautiful pictures taken, some of the, uh, the archival ones from the wars in, in the 70s in, in Beirut, taken by the great Don McCullen. And then we saw the more recent ones. Um, I just want to read what you've just written here, and I ask you both about this. This is from, from the book. In Lebanon, everybody blames everyone else for the war. Everyone was a victim. Everyone was wrong. Facts were ignored. Truth was an illusion. So the war defined politics long after it ended. In 2020, it still does. I mean, that's what you've written. Gary, do you see that um, across a lot of these uh, countries and, and peace processes that you've examined here, that sometimes it really takes a lot of time and banging a lot of heads together to, you know, to understand the story of the other and to pull back from the warlord days. Absolutely. As Robin said, it takes a lot more courage to make peace than it does to make war. And one of the bravest things I think people can do is sit down with somebody with whom they have violently opposing views, uh, listen to each other's story and start that process of of, of peace and reconciliation, actually, truth and reconciliation. And dialogue is absolutely critical. And in countries where dialogue is limited, peace is, is less successful. And in countries which have made a very significant and sincere effort to create an environment where dialogue can exist, you know, peace has prospered. You, you yourself started off in Cambodia, and obviously that had gone through, I mean, just the most terrible genocide, Pol Pot, the Khmer Rouge, and you went back and forth. What did you find from just like some anecdotes of, of I guess, the commitment to the bloodshed then compared to commitment to peace now, Gary? That's a great question, Christiane. And I think, sadly, Cambodia is one of the least successful countries. I think if you measure it by um, the amount of violence since since the end of the Khmer Rouge period, it has been a success, but that's that's a pretty low measure. Um, Cambodia had a, an international tribunal, um, but only a handful of people were convicted. I think four were convicted, five were tried. Um, and there was an awful lot of government interference there. The government is corrupt. It has enriched itself at the expense of the people. Uh, and progress has been very limited. So there is certainly a, a, a condition of peace. But if you go into the villages, and I return to many of the villages that I went to uh, when I was traveling through with soldiers in the late 80s and early 90s, the conditions there, whilst they've improved somewhat, uh, are, are really um, you know, not very successful. You don't have access to education. You often have school buildings with no teachers. Access to health care is limited. Um, and, and you do not have, by any measure, um, a free and fair political system. So uh, it's, Cambodia is, is one of the more problematic countries that we went to. And Robin, talking about the Middle East, of course, I said you're in Beirut, but you're not. You're in Washington, but you've covered that whole region for so long. Um, it strikes me also, and, and Gary you know, wrote this in the foreword, that the peacemakers are often so much less celebrated, so much less attention is put onto them than the warriors. And I, I just can't help but thinking of uh, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, whose uh, anniversary, the 25th year since he was assassinated for trying to make peace between Israel and the Palestinians. He was assassinated for that reason. Just 
I don't know whether you've, you've talked or thought a lot about the peacemakers and the, and the unbelievable pressure they're under, because they're often thought of betraying the cause by one set of extremists or the other. Absolutely. Um, I also spent several years covering South Africa and the uprising. And South Africa engaged in a truth and reconciliation process that was the model for the rest of the world. But it's very, very rare. Uh, Desmond Tutu, I think, won the Nobel Peace Prize for part of, for launching that process and overseeing it. But doing it on the ground as one individual to another is very, very hard. And it requires resources and political leverage. And in many cases, one individual doesn't have it. So that's why it creates, it, it requires such incredible courage. In a place like Lebanon, there was um, uh, one person set up a market where all on uh, once a week that that all different sects, all the different religions would come and uh, sell their wares and have little restaurants, street restaurants and so forth. But, you know, that's an enormous effort. Uh, there was another uh, former fighter who was so eventually repulsed by the number of people he had killed that he launched a group of former fighters who started telling giving lectures and to school children about the war because it's not taught in schools and that's true of wars all over the world and but there are only 50 of them and there were tens of thousands of people who fought in that war so the peacemakers are often small and they do this on their own initiative uh, often with little recognition little financial compensation uh, but great bravery Mm. I want to go to Rwanda because, uh, as I said, some of this project involves some films and there's a clip that we have um, that is Jack Picone. He's the photographer who goes back to Rwanda after the genocide. And what he's seeing is almost like a grassroots reconciliation process happening in front of his eyes. And it's been reported quite a lot over the years, but every time I see it, it strikes me as just so amazing. So we'll play a little a clip of that. Ibjona well, Alice did forgive him incredibly, and uh, they apparently remain friends. You, you do have a, 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 an amazing sort of essay by um, Judge Richard Goldstone, uh, Gary, who, who was the first judge at the International Criminal Tribunal, first for Yugoslavia, and then it went on to um, hold Rwanda's genocidal maniacs accountable. Justice is a huge part of this process, isn't it? Justice is critical, absolutely, both at a, at a, at a sort of tribunal level, at a, at a very sort of top-down level, but also, as, you, as, as the film illustrates, at a grassroots level. And without justice, you know, it's very, very, and without truth and reconciliation, as, as Robin discussed earlier, it's incredibly difficult for people to move on. Uh, it's very hard to, to forgive. It's very hard for people to rebuild their lives. And accountability is absolutely critical, and certainly something we found where you, in countries where you don't have a successful uh, justice system, tribunal, um, peace really, really struggles. And I want to now, you know, obviously bring up Bosnia, which was for me the defining war I covered. We met in Bosnia, and Ron Haviv, the yep. great uh, re photographer, who took those pictures of of the of the militia well you know the arkan and his yep. uh, group of people who were just slaughtering uh, muslims he was a serb and he was you know on the side of 
of the ethnic slaughter and the genocide there. The pictures that, that Ron took were really daring, really uh, important, and created a story that was part of the proof um, eventually in, in the court system. But you and I remember how, how much courage it took, not just to take those pictures, but also to own them, to put your name to them, because it could have, and it did, come back to, you know, the, 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 the killers came back to try to find who was telling their story. Oh, yes. I think those pictures are some of the bravest pictures that uh, anyone has ever taken. And, uh, and Ron, for years, um, you know, would have had to be very, very careful. Arkan uh, and his men were looking for Ron for many years all over the country. Um, in fact, there was another photographer in, in working in Bosnia, a young French photographer who, who looked a little like Ron, and he was constantly being arrested and, and threatened. But, uh, yeah, Ron... Ron uh, Ron did an incredible job there, actually. They're some of the most important photographs taken in the war. I, I want to ask you, well, I, I want to ask Robin first, because you, you devote a whole chapter to women and women peacemakers. And one of the early as, instances of that was uh, in Northern Ireland, famously two women, a Protestant and a Catholic. They got the joint Nobel Prize back in the 70s for, for trying to start a grassroots peace Initiative. We've got these amazing pictures by Gilles Perez um, of some of the really amazing photography taken in the midst of the so-called troubles. Um, talk to me a little bit, uh, Robin, whether it's Northern Ireland, South Africa, the Middle East, of women's roles, uh, and not to mention Liberia and elsewhere, in, in bringing and trying to forge peace. I think this is one of the most important developments when it comes to politics generally, that what we find all over the world is that through education, the education of girls that has produced a generation who are now of age to play a role in trying to push for peace in bringing societies together. One of the instrumental uh, groups in Lebanon was a, a group that of wives of fighters who came together from different sects, and they were trying to bring their husbands into a dialogue. Uh, we saw during the Arab uprising how many women were on the front lines. This is no longer uh, an environment anywhere in the world where women are uh, you know, staying at home and letting the men fight it out. It's one of the great phenomena of the 21st century. But I wanted to add one thing. You know, We keep talking about this book as if it's conflicts in the past and conflicts in remote parts of the world, when in fact, the challenge of peace is most evident today in two of America's most difficult wars, trying to, to broker a peace in Afghanistan after America's longest war, trying to create a peaceful environment in Iraq. This is a challenge that's not just remote societies, but is everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. In our final 30 seconds, Gary, what do you hope this project, the book, the, 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 the films, the exhibition, what is it that you hope it will do? Well, I think Ambassador Samantha Power puts it really well, actually, in her afterward, where, where she says, you know, that you want to avoid ever getting to the situation where you even have to make peace. And investing in diplomacy and investing heavily in preventing wars is absolutely critical. And celebrating people who make peace rather than warriors, I think, would be a really, a really great start. Well, it's an amazing book. It's really powerful. And you've got such an incredible group of people together, um, including diplomats who've, who've actually negotiated peace, that it's a really amazing how-to. Gary Knight, Robin Wright, thank you so much for being with us. Now, it seems during this year of anti-racist uprisings, the National Guard has been synonymous in America with law and order and crushing peaceful protests sometimes. So it might be a surprise to know that they also have humanitarian duties right now. In fact, across all 50 states, these troops are supporting COVID testing sites and also food banks. Major General John C. Harris Jr. is the commander of the Ohio National Guard, where food insecurity has nearly doubled since the start of the coronavirus outbreak. And here he's talking to our Hari Srinivasan from the state's largest operation, the Mid-Ohio Food Collective. It has been an incredibly busy year for the National Guard. Uh, give us an idea of the range of things that your men and women have had to respond to in 2020. <laughs> Range is the right word. Uh, we originally started this response, uh, believe it or not, uh, 
working with the Corps of Engineers, thinking that we were going to have to build alternate care sites, alternate facilities for hospitals and other healthcare organizations that might exceed their capacity. And that's in the rearview mirror now. We don't even think about that because they've dealt with that on their own. But we've put soldiers and airmen in food banks, as you well know, in response to the uh, food insecurity that's occur occurred as a result of this coronavirus. Uh, we have had to put medical staff into nursing homes as a result of surges there, losing staffing due to, due, due to positive coronavirus tests. We've put medical staff into our prison systems when they've lost medical staff. We've put soldiers and airmen into our prison systems uh, when, they've, when they've experienced uh, corrections, loss of corrections officers due to positive coronavirus. Uh, civil disturbance response in the wake of the George, George Floyd killings, and, and the list just goes on and on and on. Um, we, have, we have met just about every kind of staffing surge mission uh, that you could possibly imagine, particularly to our state institutions, but also in the case of nursing homes, private institutions, if it's a result of the coronavirus. A lot of people have, in their minds, shifted to thinking about COVID in terms of the fatalities, the infection rates, but we're literally sitting in a food bank right now. There's been this steady food insecurity that's been happening for the whole seven months, and we forget that. It, it certainly has, and in fact, this was one of the first missions to which we responded because the, the volunteer support for the food banks dropped off to zero almost immediately. Uh, when we really learned about what this disease was and who it affected, we realized that they realized that their volunteer base, many of those people who are older or who had underlying conditions, it just was not safe for them to come to come to work to volunteer here. So this is where the guard came in. And early on, we put almost 600 people in the food banks to backfill for those volunteers that they lost. And you combine that with a surge in demand. That's right, that's right. I was on a call the other day with CEOs of Ohio's food banks, and I was staggered to learn, for example, the Cleveland Call Center, their volume, their call volume increased by sevenfold people calling, trying to find how they go about getting food. Sevenfold increase in people looking to get food for their families. That's staggering. And it's not something that makes the headlines. It's sort of this, there's a certain quiet to it. Perhaps it's the shame of needing help in this way. Perhaps it's, you know, it, it's not the same as saying, you know what, I've, I've got COVID and here, Socially, we're all talking about quarantining and here are the steps that you should take. But it's a different conversation You say, I can't figure out how to feed my family. That's right, that's right. And one of, one of the underlying requirements for our soldiers and airmen doing this mission is that they treat everyone with dignity and respect. When someone leaves one of our distribution centers, when they come into contact with the guardsmen, we want them to leave feeling better than they did when they got there. They shouldn't feel shame. This is no different than any other impact of this coronavirus. And we want them to leave there with their dignity and with their respect. And our soldiers and airmen have done a fantastic job with that. I'm reminded of a story that, that one of our soldiers down in southeastern Ohio told us, a small community. And so the people who are coming through that food bank are people he know. They're people from his community. Keep in mind, our soldiers and airmen live in the communities with the people they're supporting. And he just talked about the intrinsic strength and value that he got from serving those neighbors and those relatives that were coming through that food bank and doing it in a way that let them leave there with their dignity and with their respect and knowing that they're, this is going to be better when this is all over. Tell me just a little bit about the scale of the, the food bank operation here. How many people are you deploying to this? How many people are coming through here? The scale is just incredible. It's almost incomprehensible. These soldiers and airmen, between the 14 food banks around the state of Ohio, they've packaged over 65 million pounds of food. I can't even comprehend 65 million pounds of food, but that's what's been moving through the hands of our soldiers and airmen. Are you surprised that the need is as acute? Uh, I, I knew that there'd be an increase in the need. I had no idea how much it would be. I had no idea how much it would be. Our soldiers and airmen tell us about people who've worked as volunteers at the food bank, who are now coming through the food banks um, to, get, to get food for their families. Uh, so that's, that's a 180 degree you know, social change, so to speak, and, and it's profound. And it, it is, it's, it's, it's prevalent in our rural areas, it's prevalent in our urban areas. This is, this is not just an Ohio issue, this is a US issue, this is a global issue. You're gonna be here in this active mission of supporting the food banks till the end of the year. Do you think the problem's gonna stop then? I don't. 
I don't. I think we're going to be in this for a while. I think even when we have a vaccine, it's going to take a while for that vaccine to be developed and distributed and, and put into enough arms that it makes a difference for this disease. In the meantime, we have to keep doing what we're doing. We have to keep the, the measures in place to protect ourselves, the social distancing, the masks. I will tell you, I fear that we may see worse before we see better. Here in Ohio, we know that we're starting to see some fatigue with coronavirus. Uh, that's causing a bit of a letdown in the discipline. We're coming indoors because it's getting cold and we're approaching the holidays. That, that's kind of a perfect storm for seeing an increase in the numbers for coronavirus. So I think that we may see some greater challenges before we see our way out of this. So do I think there will be a demand here at the food banks for additional help? I don't see the volunteers coming back anytime, anytime soon because the conditions haven't changed. And I don't see the food insecurity going away anytime soon. So when you have that increase on the demand side and the, the, the challenges on the supply chain side, yeah, I think it creates a need for the National Guard long after December. Uh, I want to ask also just a little bit about the Facebook video. Racism divides us and it destroys the trust between leader and led, between soldiers, between airmen, and with the American people. It's reprehensible and it will not be tolerated in our ranks. Why did you feel the need to speak out in this way against racism? I feel the need to reinforce to our soldiers and airmen at times like this, uh, particularly in, in, the, in the wake of the George Floyd death, where emotions, emotions become so strong um, to refocus our folks and make sure that they understand that, that it's okay if their opinions are divided over the issues, but we have to be united for the mission. This is essential. The readiness of the armed forces does not go away despite whatever is happening in this country. And our job, my job, is make sure that we're not only prepared for the national defense and the goal, the, the away game, but for domestic response right here. And that means that if I call you today, you have to be ready to go today. And I don't have time. I don't have time to get you ready or to have philosophical discussions. When we call you for civil disturbance in a city, I need you on the street that night and I need you to come with your A game, disciplined and fair and impartial. And if you can't park that, you can't participate in this organization. So the civil unrest that you've had to respond to this year, what do you tell your soldiers and your airmen when they get an assignment like this, when the governor calls them up and they're required to show up at a moment's notice in a city that they might not be familiar with, they might have their own opinions about what's going on on the street around them, but they're called in to do a job. Well, we tell them to do what they, what they know to do, what they've been trained to do, and that's to be fair and impartial and unbiased. Our soldiers and airmen and every officer and non-commissioned officer leader along the way knows that, that we are an apolitical organization. So when you put on this uniform, you're not a Republican or a Democrat. You're not a liberal or conservative. Uh, you are an American soldier, an American airman. And our job is, our oath is to the Constitution. And our job is to enforce the everyone's right. At, we support local law enforcement as they support everyone's right in that case to express their first amendment rights. It doesn't matter if you like what they're saying or dislike what they're saying. Your opinion in this case is irrelevant. Your mission is what's important. And it's because of doing that in such a disciplined way that we're able to maintain the trust with the public that we have. Also, when the public sees us doing missions like these, when they see us in the food banks, when they see us out there doing testing for coronavirus all over the state, they get to know the guard, they learn to trust the guard, and again, they know that it's their friends and their neighbors. So when we have to show up for those tough missions, like civil disturbance, that trust comes with us. And they know that our people are going to conduct their mission as fairly and as impartially as they can. And, and to the person, whether that was a Tamir Rice verdict, whether that was the, the Republican National Committee that convention that we had here a few years ago, whether it was the most recent debate, or whether it's civil disturbance, when we put our people out there with the public, invariably, they do that job just in a fantastic manner because that's what they've learned to do. This is a, a time of increased polarity and political tension in the country. And it's hard for people to remember that there's human beings inside the uniform, that there are our neighbors and our relatives and our family, right? So how, how do you get through that message to your soldiers and your airmen that you are a part of this community that you're helping serve 
even if someone is irate and in your face and you might agree with them, but you got this uniform on, this is your duty right now. Well, as in anything that we try to inculcate into our service members, you can't just say it once. It really has to become a part of the DNA in the organization. So it starts long before we put those soldiers and airmen on the street for missions like these. It, it, it goes down to everything from their social media posts. You can't be a soldier on your social media and have these strong political opinions. Uh, it's, 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 it's counter to what we're trying to accomplish. So we're constantly watching not only individual sites, but not, not, not monitoring for their opinion, but just ensuring that they're not mixing their military duty with their, with their political or, or social agenda. Can't do that. So it's perfectly fine to have a site where you're expressing your, your opinion. We want you to have your opinion. Perfectly fine to be a soldier, but if you're mixing being a soldier with some kind of political activism, you can't do that. So we ingrain that in our folks from the very beginning. You are apolitical when you put this on. Now, when you're having dinner with your family, we want you to have those debates. We want you to be who you are. We want you to express yourself. But understand, when you convert from citizen to soldier, you're expected to be 100% soldier. You had an unfortunate incident recently that uh, the governor uh, was talking about when one of the members that you deployed to Washington, D.C. had uh, made a sign toward white supremacy. When you saw that the evidence from that, when you heard that this happened, what went through your mind? Well, it's very disturbing. It's very disturbing because we know that there are organizations that are infiltrating the military ranks to get the military training, and in some cases to try to influence other military members. And that erodes the very trust that's the foundation of everything we do. So when I say it's disturbing, it's disturbing because, because we certainly don't want that image, we don't want that brand for our military. It certainly disrupts what we're trying to accomplish as an, as an impartial, apolitical organization. So we have to eliminate it very quickly. And that soldier, once the FBI brought that to our attention, because they were, he was operating, he was operating undercover. He certainly wasn't being overt using his, his real identity, of course. He was operating as part of these organizations and out there in social media space as someone else. But when the FBI brought this to our attention, we dealt with it very quickly and very abruptly. And it just shows the value of the partnerships that we have as the Guard also, those longstanding relationships with other agencies. They brought it to our attention. We dealt with it very swiftly and very quickly because it is the foundation of what we do that that soldier was eroding. So how do you root that out? How do you make sure you're finding where these conversations are existing, either silently in person or under a pseudonyms online? We as the military are, are prohibited and we should never collect information, store information or, or distribute information about US persons. That's not what we do. So other agencies help us with that quite a bit as they watch these organizations, but it gets tougher every day. These organizations are very good about how they use social media now. It used to be easy, they were very open in social media. They've gotten smart about the techniques that our partners use. Uh, so they've, they've become very uh, covert and how they operate out there in social media space, how they organize, how they distribute their propaganda. Uh, so it becomes harder for those organizations, but we count on those organizations. In addition to the background checks that we do when we assess a person, we count on those organizations to help us monitor um, the folks in our ranks who may be outside of what's appropriate for us. We've got three weeks or less, less than three weeks till the election. How's the National Guard gonna support the days leading up to the election, the day of the election, and possibly the days after? Well, we, we have several initiatives underway right now. Most are simply augmenting things that we already do. For example, uh, we have cybersecurity, something that's very important to us. And we've had ongoing relationships with our Secretary of State's office uh, for quite some time working with them to assure that we can, we assess the vulnerability of their systems and do the best we can to make sure that they have the best assessment of their systems that we can possibly provide to them. Um, moreover, you know, we look, at, we look at the seven metropolitan areas in Ohio. We have seven major metropolitan areas. And uh, if we were to respond to civil disturbance in multiple metropolitan areas at once, what would that look like? We conduct tabletop exercises with local leaders, local law enforcement, with our own state highway patrol to ensure that if we did have to respond to something that we, that we would. You feel prepared? I do feel prepared. But I think it's important to note that, that on election day, don't expect to see uniformed service folks around the, 
around the polling places. That's something that that uh, we're very sensitive to. Uh, we don't want the perception that we're in any way influencing voting either for or against. And we certainly don't want our soldiers or airmen actually working the polling places. We know that here in Ohio, I, I shouldn't say that, not in uniform, not in a duty status. If they're in their citizen status, want to go, they feel a civic responsibility to volunteer to work the polls, we want them to do that. But you won't see any military, uniformed military Ohio National Guard soldiers working the polls because that's counter to the message that we want to send to the voters of Ohio. Major General Harris, thanks so much. Thank you so much, sir. Commander Harris made a very important point just then. And finally, is working from home leaving you feeling isolated, disconnected, or even uninspired at times? Well, a theme park in Tokyo in Japan has a solution for you. Yomuri Land is offering teleworkers an amusement workstation package, which comes with a ride on the Ferris wheel, which is equipped with portable Wi-Fi routers and, of course, also some productive leisure time by the pool. And that's it for our program tonight. Remember, you can follow me and the show on Twitter. Thank you for watching Amanpour & Company on PBS, and join us again next time.